Hello everyone, hope you're doing well. Today we're going to look at the ground vehicles from the Pasta developers for March of 2022 and see what's going on with that. Also, just as a little update to the issues that I've been having, um, basically uh, I've been having a ton of stuttering when it comes to the game and it's actually making stuff like aerialistic impossible to play uh, because whenever an enemy gets close to me, um, it just kind of screws over um, my uh, it screws over my game and I can't actually maneuver or anything like that. Uh, at the same point, uh, I've checked, it's not my graphics card, it's fine, uh, and it's not my monitor, it's fine. The only thing it can be is War Thunder. So if other people are experiencing issues like this, hopefully they'll get it fixed in the future because it's getting super annoying. I've found a temporary fix, but it doesn't really fix it, it just lessens the issue. Um, I've increased my FPS, so uh, now I run it at 120 FPS. Uh, and also turned VSync off, and it's helped a little bit, but it still is there, it's just not as noticeable. Anyway, let's get into the stuff which was passed for the ground this month. So the first vehicle is of American origin, and it is the M7 medium tank. Now the M7 medium tank is actually a really interesting vehicle, and uh, hopefully it does make it into the game. Uh, hopefully it gets into the standard text tree. But basically, what the M7 was supposed to be was a replacement for the Stuart series of tanks, which were considered to be undergunned and also under-armoured. The tank passed trials and a warrant for building these machines were given. However, the tank was considered inferior to the M4 Sherman due to its lack of armour and also no firepower increase, only a very minor speed increase, and the project therefore was cancelled in favour of the M4 Sherman at this point of time, though seven M7s had been built, so at least there was some prototypes. The, the M7 was standardised by a variant of the T7, which was known as the T7E5. Now, the M7 itself, it had a right Continental R975C1 engine. This gave it 350 horsepower, and also um, it was 24,470 kilos when combat uh, stopped, so not a light machine. The crew, it had five, uh, which was of course standard for America, the loader commander gunner in the turret, and also the driver and assistant driver in the front, and the armor was uh, where it was quite light, but remember this was supposed to uh, replace the Stuart. The whole front was 38 millimeters angled at 50 degrees, the sides were 31.8 millimeters thick, and the rear was 25 millimeters thick, with the top deck being 19 millimeters thick. So overall, definitely not a, uh, you know, crazily armed vehicle, but would stop stuff like heavy machine guns, which would be nice. The gun mantlet was the heaviest at 64 millimeters thick, so that, you know, could be quite nice for the vehicle. And also, at the same point, the gun itself that it used was the 75 millimeter M3, which um, is pretty much the same as the Sherman, on the uh, M47 mount. Uh, it carried 71 rounds uh, of ammunition, and also at the same time, it had a pretty decent turret traverse at 24 degrees per second, and also had 8 degrees of gun depression. The vehicle didn't have access to a 50 cal, however. It had a coaxial 30 cal, and also a ball mount 30 cal in the hull, and a 30 cal in a flexible AA position. Kind of interesting that they didn't go for a 50, but I'm guessing they didn't want anything that crazy. Thinking about it, the Stuart also didn't have it either. Either. Another thing to also note was there was also a T7E2, which was one of the vehicles, and this was exactly the same as the standard M7, uh, but it was armed with a British Ordnance QF6 pounder gun, the 57mm Mark III, which is the same one on the Crusader Mark III. Um, that you can find in the game. It used the same shells, of course, as those, um, but unfortunately, when it comes to uh, when it comes to the uh, machine itself, it might have not ever actually loaded the gun uh, on the 57 millimeter on the chassis of the T7. But hopefully it did, uh, so we can get a pretty cool and interesting vehicle for the British as well.
For Japan, we have the Type 91 heavy tank. Now, the Type 91 is kind of a bridge between the Type 87 and also the Type 95. The Type 87 being a previous heavy tank and the Type 95 being the one that, you know, you probably know the most about. So the first prototype of the Type 91 was actually built in 1931 and there were a few differences between its predecessor and it. Uh, the main one was the change in the front turret, um, which obviously housed a machine gun. Uh, other differences also, it had a different engine. It used the BMW 6 inline six cylinder gas gasoline engine and also it was an 18 ton vehicle and the engine was likely purchased from Germany uh, which would make the most sense. The tank itself had three turrets, it had the main one which had access to a 57 millimeter uh, the, it also had two secondary forward and also rear turrets armed with 65 millimeter machine guns. And of course, the vehicle doesn't have a lot of armor with only 8 to 17 millimeters in different areas. Basically, the Imperial Japanese Army decided to develop some heavy vehicles like this because of the increasing threat posed by the Soviet Union, which would have been a potential enemy of Japan in East Asia. The first design was not very successful and the project itself was cancelled pretty quickly but the project later became a stepping stone in the development of the Type 95 heavy tank which did see a little bit more success. For China, we have the M24A1. This is a modernized version of the standard M24 chaffy tank, which you will be used to. Basically, the M24A1 was a locally modified version of the Second World War vehicle. Remember that the US gave a bunch of nations the chaffy tank after World War II, meaning that uh, it definitely got modernized quite a lot, which was pretty cool. And in China's case, in 1954, the the United States provided through a military assistance program, the Republic of China, 233 M24 light tanks. And in 1957, a new engine, a diesel engine, was introduced into the military market, and this engine was the Detroit Diesel 6V53T. This was a turbocharged six-cylinder diesel engine, and it had 275 horsepower. Um, the basic uh, thing about this engine is it was less powerful than the standard M24's engine, but it also had a greater torque in it. So this was the engine selected as the basis for the modernization of the Chinese chaffees. The modernization program began sometime after 1961, and all ROC M24s were modified to the standard and redesignated the M24A1. It was powered by the earlier mentioned 6V53T, which also shared commonality with the M113 in ROC service, which had the weaker 6V53. The 6V53T required a minor modification of the rear engine deck, the most notable visual change on the M24A1, and in addition to that, it also received a new transmission, which increased its maximum speed to 65 km an hour, and there were also some other minor changes, such as the removal of the assistant driver, the whole machine gun, and the installation of an IR driving lamp on some of the vehicles. The top 50 car mount was also relocated in front of the commander and loader's hatches, and in 1966, the Republic of China received another 56 M24s, which were modified to M24A1 standards. Towards the mid-1990s, M24s were assigned to units located on the eastern side of Taiwan, where roads were more narrow and also suitable for smaller tanks, and the M24A1 continued its service on the small islands uh, controlled by the ROC until 1999, when it was finally retired. The French get a dose of nightmare fuel in the Panhard M3 VDA. This thing is so crazy. Uh, it looks really interesting. Basically, in 1973, the development of the Panhard M3 VDA began based on the highly successful Panhard M3 chassis that was exported to over 30 countries. It was developed to provide smaller countries without major military industry with a small but highly effective and yet cheap mobile anti-aircraft platform. So, yep, 
this thing was developed for the export market and was actually never used within the French army. But obviously in game, we have many um, stuff or we have many things which are foundations which were designed for export. So that isn't really an issue. The first prototype of the vehicle was completed in December of 1973. And in April of 1975, the production of the Panhard M3 VDA had started. It was exported to several countries, most notably uh, the Ivory Coast, uh, Niger, and also the United Arab Emirates. Some are still in service today, but the vehicle is not produced anymore. This vehicle has access to two 20mm Orlikan Contraves, the 820 SL auto cannons. It also has some smoke discharges on it, which is always quite nice, and has a top speed of 90 kilometers an hour, thanks to its um, 4HD four-cylinder um, engine, which gives it 90 horsepower, giving it a power to weight of about 13 horsepower per ton. It has a crew of three, the driver, gunner, commander, and has pretty much no armor on the machine since it's an AA, only 12 millimeters at most. But yeah, this thing could be very deadly in certain situations. The Swedish get the STRV M31 and the STRV FM31. These are both very interesting vehicles with very technical designs to them when it comes to their tracks because they don't just, well, at least one of them doesn't just use tracks, it also can use wheels. Basically, in October of 1931, the Swedish army placed an order for three conventional and one-wheeled type uh, track-type uh, tanks from Landsverk. Internally, these tanks would be referred to as the L-10 and also the L-30, but they would be officially designated the SDRV M31 and SDRV FM31 by the Swedish military. For the most part, the L10 and L30 were designed to share the same layout and major components, but with different suspensions. The L30 improved on the wheel track suspension of the Raider Raupen Kampfwagen M28 GFK and featured a slightly narrower chassis compared to the L10. The transition to wheeled mode took about 30 seconds and could be done while the tank was moving. In this mode, the L30 could reach a top speed of 80 kilometers an hour on roads. However, the heavier suspension didn't allow for a satisfactory level of armor protection without breaking the 12-ton weight limit. The track suspension was identical between the two designs. By getting rid of the hybrid suspension, the armor protection of the L10 was increased to 24 millimeters compared to 14 millimeters of the L30. In general, the armor layout was ahead of its time. The front was well sloped, and the design made extensive use of welding in its construction, which was rare in the early 1930s. For main armaments, both 37mm and 47mm caliber guns had been considered, but ultimately a 37mm was chosen due to its superior rate of fire and also penetration. This gun was an early version of the Bofors 37mm, which would go on to become one of the most widely used anti-tank guns of the pre-World War II period. The vehicles carried 4,000 rounds of 6.5mm for the two machine guns and 122 rounds for the 37mm. The tanks were powered by the Maybach DSO-8 V12 gasoline engine, delivering a respectable 200 horsepower at 3,000 RPM, resulting in a power-to-weight ratio of around 17 to 18 horsepower per ton. The good power-to-weight ratio, coupled with the substantially improved suspension design, gave the tanks a top speed of 40 km an hour on tracks. For communication, the tank was equipped with a two-way radio as well. And after some delays, uh, the SDRF FM31 and the three SDRV M31s were delivered to the Swedish army late in 1934. By the time of their delivery, the SDRV M31 and FM31 were arguably the most modern tanks in the world, but unfortunately, like many designs ahead of their time, the L10 and L30 proved to have major teething issues, most of which were related to the drivetrain. The transmission, as well as the tracks, were fragile and also hard to repair, and changing the transmission required the engine and fuel tank to be removed first. During winter conditions, snow would build up in the drive wheel, causing the tank to lose its track. 
The extensive use of foreign components in the design meant that spare parts also had to be imported. And between 1935 and 1939, the tanks were stationed at the 12 Gotha Livgard Tank Battalion, where they ended up mostly serving as training vehicles due to their reliability issues. During World War II, there were plans to convert the M31s to command tanks, but nothing really ever came of it. And ultimately, the STRV M31 and FM31 ended up being somewhat underwhelming vehicles, but the experience gained from their construction would be proved or would be proved to be important lessons for both the Swedish Army and also Landsverk themselves. Landsverk will go on to use this experience in the making of the L60, a modified version of which ended up replacing the STRV M31 in 1938. So uh, even though this thing wasn't a success, at least uh, parts of it were used in future ideals. The last vehicle is for Israel, and it is for the M5 half-track light tank. Uh, this one is actually a really odd and weird machine, uh, but definitely interesting to uh, see. So Israel, uh, obviously after its creation in the late 40s, uh, had a bit of an issue when it came to uh, actually getting weapons. There was a ton of different embargoes that were in place, meaning that getting new machines uh, was not exactly easy. And also on top of this, they were getting attacked from many different sides um, because of their existence. Uh, so basically, what they decided to do was to innovate, uh, which is what you know a ton of different countries do in times of necessity. South Africa did a lot of innovation and had a ton of really interesting vehicles uh, that came out of it, and Israel was no different uh, when it came to it, and one of them is this M5 half-track. So what they did is they took a standardized M5 hard track, obviously from America, and decided to modify it. After some battles uh, with certain countries, um, such as Egypt um, at the time, what ended up happening is uh, Israel was able to knock out a bunch of vehicles that were using, such as the Daimler Mark I and also the Humber Mark IVs. And what they decided to do is go to the battlefields after them, salvage parts, uh, which of course was a, a good idea to try and uh, redo them, and then add some of those parts to an M5 half-track. So what they uh, did is they took the turrets of stuff like the Daimler and the Humber and plonked them on top of M5 half-tracks. This meant that you had a 37mm turreted mount on top of an M5 and also access to another gun as well in a smaller turret uh, on the front. Now, these modifications, they didn't happen in a wide scale. Uh, they were much more a smaller scale idea, and uh, it's still really interesting how they did it. It looks like overall, when it comes to the guns, you had the 37mm, obviously the M5 or the M6. This fired APC-BC rounds and uh, could fire 20 rounds per minute with a good penetration. And also, uh, there is a machine gun in a little turret on the front, which is probably a 7.92mm Besser machine gun. It uh, also could have been a 7.92mm MG34, but basically this thing, uh, if looking at the pictures, looks like it had a 50 cal on top, and then a coaxial for the main turret, and then a secondary machine gun on it as well. This thing must have been heavy as all hell, by the way, with its standard engine, the 142 uh, horsepower one, and it would probably get around about 40.5 horsepower uh, per ton, which would be surprising because of all of the added weight. The armor, of course, uh, would only be around 16 millimeters at the front of it. It also had additions to the superstructure, but still nothing. Uh, which could give it any uh, proper armor, but really is a unique design and interesting, and hopefully will eventually make it into the game. As always, I hope you have a wonderful day, and I'll see you next time. I'd just like to thank Merciless Reaper, Jerry Provolt, Mega Dino King, Professor X1718, Orange Tail, Sakoshi Tiger, Teddy, John Ryman, Universe, Eugen's Terry, Ambrosius McClellan, Daniel Stanton, Martinez, Moxie, B. Young, and Derek R. Barine, Lafouche, and Samuel Slick for supporting the channel.